Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome once again to your favorite horror podcast with your hosts, Freddie Prinz Jr., John Lee Brody. Ladies and gentlemen, here comes That Was Pretty Scary. What's up, you guys? It's Freddie Prinz Jr., And on today's episode, we are doing a film that John himself introduced me to. It's from South Korea, and it's called A Tale of Two Sisters. You guys, this movie blew my mind, but um, our highest rated segment, as always, is uh, the trailer guy voice. You guys didn't know we got those ratings already? Oh, okay. Here we go. Here's the, the breakdown for A Tale of Two Sisters. After spending time in a mental hospital, a girl is reunited with her sister and returns home, only to see some truly strange events start to happen. This is A Tale of Two Sisters. And since we're doing a film from South Korea, and my co-host here is so beautifully Korean that it hurts, ladies and gentlemen, here's your Korean moment of the day with John Lee Brody. Here it comes, everybody. Uh, 안녕하세요. 여러분 들은 Freddy Pence Jr. 하고 John Lee Brody가 아주 무서워 podcast 듣고 계십니다. 오늘 저희들은 uh, 한국 공포 영화 장화 허리형 이야기 하고 있습니다. Uh, 그리고 한국 분들은 위하여 한국으로 uh, 말씀드리겠어요. Thank you very much. 감사합니다. Dude, that's... <laughs> I know I probably shouldn't say this, but that was like way sexy, bro. <laughs> <laughs> well, two episodes in, we're international, man. So we, we got to have translators and everything for our second episode. Really? In. I think we're doing good. That sounded cool, man. I got to learn me some Korean. I'll teach um, you some stuff. I'll teach you some stuff. Uh, we're going to watch show- more Korean movies. So I was going to say, stuff. I get full immersion when we watch these Korean ones. So you guys, I'm going to let John break down a lot of this movie for you guys and i'll 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 jump in there on some of my favorite parts but this was directed by ji woon kim am i saying that right john yeah and in korea you would do the last name first so kim ji woon if you want to sound proper korean it's a little korean lesson for you today Uh, thank you very much sir um and he also wrote this as well and you guys may start to get familiar as we talk about this movie because there was an absolutely that's not nice to say, Freddie. There is a, a not a, a not as good version that was made here in America. I believe it was titled The Uninvited. Mm-hmm. And uh, I watched it. I missed this movie completely. I watched it by myself to not make John suffer because I love him. Um, after we watched A Tale of Two Sisters to see what the American version was. And there is not a scary moment in the American version because they really failed to capture some of the things that John and I are going to share with you in today's episode that what made it special. It's not this like CGI masterpiece because I like CGI. It's much more simplistic. The horror is based in more paranoia than anything. And he makes you almost beg him to scare you. Mm -hmm. It's a nice, like slow burn the way America used to make horror movies. You're wanting to be scared. And he's like, nah, not yet. And then you're like, oh, son of a bitch. (laughs) And then it comes again. He's like, no, 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 not yet. And you're like, oh, you bastard. And you're like, okay, he's finally, no, he's not going to go. Oh, Jesus Christ. (laughs) And then you freak out. Now, here's the things I love about this movie. And then I'm going to throw it to you. And and real quick though, Freddie, because what what you just described is I think really important because there's horror and then there's terror. Horror is like the things you see, kind of like the stuff you see in front of you, but the terror is like what's going to happen, the anticipation, the anxiety of is something going to happen, is not going to happen. And I think those are two really important terms for, uh, any kind of horror enthusiast or any kind of cinephile would want to learn. So there's horror and there's terror. And as a filmmaker, you want to make sure you balance the two, which Kim Ji-un, as we saw, found that balance, just like Daniel Sun in The Karate Kid. (laughs) 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 They use a very white karate reference uh, to talk about a Korean film. Yes, (laughs) he did not. Our guy did not fall off the boat because he was already. (laughs) He stayed dry. (laughs) So, okay, so this is a weird way to describe horror. But this was the single most beautiful horror film I've ever seen. And yes, I've seen everything Guillermo del Toro's done. And yes, I agree. 
that is beautiful horror 90% of the time. I don't care. This movie was, they weren't, you guys, they're not afraid of shadows. American horror films today, you can see every corner of every single room. And if you can't, it's because that's the giant monster you're seeing in the very first act instead of making you wait for it. They, pl- they don't light the entire room. They don't light the entire hallway. They allow there to be moments of darkness that the characters walk through, walk around. It's just, it's a dark spot in the hall. They, it's, it doesn't have to be filled with light. And it allows your brain to kind of play with you as to where they're going to catch you in this movie, right? So, like I said, in the the wonderful, the absolutely wonderful is what I'm hearing, uh, movie trailer guy voice. That's what the people yeah. are saying, John. Yeah, sorry, Rob. You, you still don't have a job. <laughs> that'll, be the, that'll be our first T-shirt. Sorry, Rob. Um, <laughs> but from the cast, they have like, the the South Korean George Clooney in there as the dad, like super just handsome, the angular jaw. Then there's the two sisters. And there's also the stepmother who is beautifully evil and wicked and mm-hmm. cruel and a victim all at the same time. It's just amazing how they pulled this off. But the two sisters, and one is the superior actor to the other, but she's the one with the majority of the dialogue. Mm-hmm. She's so good. There were times that I wasn't even reading the subtitles and I knew exactly what she was communicating in moments of frustration and anger and hatred of this stepmother character, which, which we'll get into. But every, when she was angry, it was beautiful. When things break, it was beautiful. Everything about this movie was just, you blew me away with this man. And this was out in Oh three, you said. And so this mm-hmm. completely passed me by. I had never heard of it. And we basically, after that, I said, we have to have like at least like 10, 15 Korean movies a year, oh. the, the Asian movies. A year. Cause I know Japanese horror and I've seen a couple like mm-hmm. Chinese horror, like fantasy horror things, but I didn't know about, South Korean horror outside of the big ones like Train to Busan and things, which we'll actually, right. which we'll actually cover on the show. Oh yeah! But this was by far, by far, not only the best Asian horror film I've ever seen, one of my favorite horror films that I've ever seen, and it's all because of you. So thank you, please, John. You got it, man. I got it. Please break down this beautiful film for us. And I'm going to, you know, interrupt you a lot and break your flow and ruin the episode. No, I've, no, it's a conversation. That's, that's the beauty of our show. You know, you get that, you talk, I talk, and then we have a dialogue. And I wanted to start with this because we had discussed Train to Busan. And that's when I said, we, I really want you to watch Tale of Two Sisters. Ours is known as, in Korea, Chang Wang Horyong, which is uh, Rose Flower, Red Lotus. Bro, that sounds and, so uh, it's Rose actually, Flower, oh, Red Lotus. That's important yeah. too. There were a lot of beautiful visuals in this film. Sorry to interrupt, but yeah. Yes, on. and even the name of the character, Sumi, is the main girl played by uh, Lim Soo-jung. Uh, that means Rose. And then the name of her sister was Soo-yeon, which means Lotus. So Kim Ji-un was very much on point in terms of honoring the original fable, basically, from the Joseon dynasty. I would liken this to, remember the Grimm Brothers fairy tales? When Cinderella was really... I, that's how, what the analogy I can give in terms of the basis of the inspiration for this film. So this this goes way back to the Joseon dynasty in terms of where the story comes from. What Kim Ji Yoon did was do like a loose adaptation and put that into the modern era, which at the time was 2003. And yeah, I wanted to do this one because this movie was the first uh, Korean horror movie to ever get a theatrical release in America. That's right. It was so, yeah. it's the most successful horror film in the history, or at least was at one point in the history of South Korea. So yeah. successful that got an American release date. Yes. Y- yeah. And uh, that's why I was like, let's start with this one because to use the sports analogy and you and I are both sports guys, this is like the magic and bird for South Korean horror movies in the U S and that gave it a platform to allow the trains of Busan's, the whalings to really shine here in the yeah, States. Yeah. And uh, just like Magic and Bird elevated the NBA to a point where Michael Jordan could have a platform to really blow up and be Michael Jordan. It mainstreamed so, basketball for people before then, you know, playoff games were on tape delay, things like yeah. that. And it really made it more popular. And this film did sort of smash open 
you know, the door was unlocked, but this sort of smashed it open because Hollywood saw it as a financial success. Um, so they were going to start taking more risks and things like that. Um, and then just remake everything in a crappier version. But please, con- <laughs> in a very- please continue. I'll get more honest as the podcast continues. Oh, that's that's what it's all about. And the further we go into the seasons, you know, like it'll just be super, super raw. You yeah, know, like exactly. there won't be any editing. Um, to paint a picture for everybody, too, 2003. The scope of horror was still really weird. Remember, this is a year before Saw came out, before James Wan flipped the American horror genre on its head. It was in a weird place of like the movies coming out were Freddy versus Jason, House of a Thousand Corpses. <laughs> Those are the more things coming out in 2003. There is a but, place in the world for Freddy versus Jason. You know what? I we will watch that one because to me, it's campy, those bro. Really it's, fun to yeah, watch. it's campy yeah. and fun, man. But um, we weren't getting those really good scary horror movies like a tale of two sisters really presented to us but also in korea 2003 was a big year for movies which really led to us getting more of these awesome korean directors so the other two movies that came out that year old boy from Puck oh Chung. my god what a gross crazy movie man right it's really good you guys but it's really gross Yes, and you might not be okay with the content. It, it just a huge with, trigger warning for anybody out yeah, there. Yeah, don't watch the Korean old boy. <laughs> I would say don't watch it, but I don't mean that as in like I hated the movie. I just mean there's a lot of people who'd be like, "Ooh, <laughs> I can't handle this," and be mad at us for saying it. But yes, th- yes. Yeah. And then the other one that came out, in t- <laughs> and then the other one that came out in 2003 was Memories of Murder, Korean title, Sunning We Chuyok, Sunning We Chuyok. Uh, Memories of Murder by the great Bong Joon-ho who won the Oscar for Parasite a couple years ago. Oh, no way. Yeah, so 2003 was really the year of what I consider the big three Korean directors, like three of my biggest Korean inspirations, which is Kim Ji-yoon, Park Chan-wook, and then Bong Joon-ho. And Bong Joon-ho is kind of the Korean Hitchcock meets Scorsese. If you watch his movies, which is really cool. And Park Chan-wook is kind of a Tarantino type, very neo-noir kind of different styling. Kim Ji-yoon is, I see a lot of myself in him because he's like the ultimate cinephile. And you see it in his movie. Like when we were watching, remember you're like, when the two sisters run off into the field and that orchestral piece plays, like, oh, oh that's kind of Sergio God, Leone. Yeah. That's kind of this. And Kim Ji-yoon, like that's really who he is. He loves movies so much and he finds a way to kind of- And he's not just horror. To them. He's not just yes. horror. He's done all kinds of different things. Yeah. And he loves to pay tributes to the movies he loves so much, but not be so on the nose and copy them. It's just he takes the essence of that and makes it so it retrofits into what he's doing, which is what we saw in this one. Because in overall Korean films, which is really cool, and American films used to do this before everything got you know too corporate, was it was more genre bending. They're not afraid to like let there be funny moments and then have the scary moments. And then even the way he lit the shots where there's that shot of the two sisters outside, I think I was telling you that looks like an indie darling Sundance film. Yeah. But then when we're inside and the, we're seeing some of the scares, like that looks like a classic scary horror movie, you know, and they're not afraid to do that, but it never feels forced or anything like that. It's all about meshing it together. And that's also because in Korea, they have a longer pre-production process. Anyone who's not familiar with the terms, pre-production is pretty much everything you do before uh, production, which is when you film the movie. Where here, I think if you're lucky, you maybe get 48 weeks if you're lucky. I don't even know what it yeah, is anymore. Yeah, back in the but. day, like when we did I Know What You Did, you still got a lot of time. We yeah. uh, we were even given two weeks of rehearsals uh, out there wow. on location before we even started filming. But you're dead you're dead on with that. Preparation is so is so key just to set just to set this this story up so you guys yeah. know what you're getting into. And I'm still well, when we get to a certain point, we'll decide if we're going to do spoilers or not, because it's an old movie. You know what I mean? But yeah. if it's new to someone else, I don't want to wreck anything for him. So I think and it we might should be avoid because it. it's really hard to find because remember, I had to really search we, for us to even be able to watch it because the DVD is out of print. You have to go on like eBay and hope that somebody's going to sell it to you. It's really hard to find. And so let me hopefully uh, let me set this up. Let me set this up. Yeah, yeah, please, please. Um, All right. So the movie opens. And we're in this like Stanley Kubrick, sterile hospital, mental hospital kind of vibe, right? Everything's creepy and gross and not gross, sterile, the opposite of gross. It just looks, everything's too clean, right? And there's this young girl there and she's beautiful, but she's vacant. Like there's, you can tell something horrible has happened to this, to this kid. 
and all you want to do is see like a happy child, right? Because when you open a movie on a kid, you don't want to see them sad. That makes us love you and follow your story for the next 90 minutes. Um, so she's basically getting out of the hospital and she's going home. And, and as this scene kind of goes away into nothingness, this car drives up this rural Japanese road to this, it looks like a house probably built in the eighties in like rural Japan, away from the city. They have a lot of land. It looks like it's close to water, which he does something beautiful with in the first act of the movie. And the father gets out of the car and he's weary. You guys, he's weird, not world weary. There's been a tragedy in this family and we don't know what it is. And he gets out of the car and the girl from the hospital and her sister get out of the car. And they're just like you said, it looks like this indie darling movie, right? Because it's just this beautiful setting. It looks like a Wes Anderson movie that was made in 1997. And it's this gorgeous shot, but there's so much sadness that it doesn't allow you to even appreciate the view when it's nothing but beauty. And it's not until these girls go down to the dock and start kind of like being alone away from the father, away from the stepmother, away from the house where clearly this tragedy has happened. And it's a shot on feet and I'm not a foot fetish guy, but when you hear what they're discussing and you can see like the pain within them, it just, it's a nice moment to allow them to relax, right? And it relaxes the audience as well. And it's sort of in that moment where they're called back to the house is where you're feeling the best in this movie. It's the only time that you feel good. And once they're in the house, this thing just takes over your life as an audience member. This film sort of takes over your life and it makes you question and then re-question the whole film by the time it's over so jump in there john because that's kind of the setup for this film and we can't get to that turning moment right because i don't think we should spoil it but 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 jump in there as far as how they kind of built these scenes their philosophies on tension whatever you want to talk about dude yeah and the biggest thing that uh I'm going to talk about this a lot through the course of our, our journey with this podcast. I'm a big fan of, and I think this is, this is where comedy and horror really align. I'm a big fan of silence. I don't think you should always rely on the big joke or the big scare or even the underscore is even if you have like a really badass John Carpenter type, you know, movie score going or a John Williams score. I honestly like John movie. Carpenter more. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, but this is this movie is a real uh, kind of poster child for that because when they walk into the house, like they could have kept using that orchestral piece that was out there to kind of keep that thing going. But to your point, that's kind of setting us up for it. This is as good as the movie's going to get. It's the only this moment. good <laughs> moment you get, you guys. So enjoy it now. And then they walk into the house and all you're really hearing is kind of the ambiance of the footsteps the silence, the vacantness yeah. of the house. And it's heavy, as Freddie said, you know that something went down in this house and to really go from a mental health perspective. And when something tragic happens at a certain place, whether it's you lost somebody or you had a panic attack somewhere, it's hard to go back to where that place happened. And this is really what's happening here. And you're feeling that tension as they go in. And then all of a sudden, uh, the stepmom, Yoon Ju, comes in and goes, oh, uh, I'll just say, oh, you know, chung sui, oh, like, uh, she'd be basically saying, come in, I cleaned the whole place for you. But like, just out of nowhere. And that's, I don't want to call that a fake scare, but that could have been, it was like a jump scare moment because you're not expecting her to come in so abruptly. And because it, it makes, works because of the silence. And it makes the sister so uncomfortable. Yeah. And they don't even say anything. It's just their reaction that it makes us, the audience, because we're pulling for the sisters right away. It makes us uncomfortable and it makes us go, <laughs> something's off with this lady. This woman, you guys, she's the glue of this movie. She plays the step, mm -hmm. the the wicked stepmother. Yeah. Um, but she I don't I've never seen her in anything else, or if I have, I just didn't put it two and two together. She is the glue of this movie, the absolute heart and soul the 
the protagonist, the antagonist, the impetus for ev- like she is everything in this movie. I mm-hmm. don't know if she's a big star in South Korea. You you may, but she should be. I mean, she was amazing. She and here and I and I only know this because when I was growing up, uh, my buddy was Korean and his mom was the same way. She is equally complimentary as she is critical like Mm -hmm. and there is no level one it's a 10 on the compliment or a 10 on the criticism and so (laughs) she constantly makes you feel uncomfortable in every scene you're in because she never and this is something genius that that the director did she's never in the same place emotionally at the end of a scene as when the scene began and mm-hmm. since it's all her responsibility to drive the energy in these scenes, if they mess that up even once, that scene sucks and you don't want it yep. in the movie. So she is, her performance is flawless. I don't ever want to hear a dubbed version of her ever because the way she communicates, you barely even needed the subtitles. Please continue. And it's so subtle too, because you you see it unfold in real time where you have to watch it again. Like, wait, wait, I need to see that again because... You see where she started, where she ended. It's very kind of sneaky how that happens. And also very strategic editing too, back to your point of the two girls having the reactions. So really not cutting into them too much. And then that one shot of their hands, you know, holding each other a little tighter. Hands and feet, right? The whole movie's hands and feet, Yeah, you know what I mean? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, it's it's definitely a thing. Maybe one day we'll have Kim ji on the podcast and we can uh, can ask him about it. I want the makeup Um, artist that had to do the close-up every single scene (laughs) on a hand and on a finger. And what was the process? So uh, in Korean, it's son. So if you want to learn a Korean word, son, and then bal is uh, is feet. We do Korean word of the day every episode. Yeah, exactly so uh but that that's such a great thing you bring up freddie and you have such a keen eye in terms of performances and i've learned so much about performances the more we watch movies together and about whether it's myself or just others and it's amplified even more and now that i've really i lost a lot of my korean language the past few years and i'm just now i'm really just now getting it back oh, bravo, sir. and uh, to the point where i was confident enough to say it on this episode but i was i'm able to notice those nuances too and That's such a great point to bring up because she made it look easy. And that's very, very difficult for someone to do where I don't have any qualms saying, I don't think I could do that. I mean, I would need a lot of practice. That's when you know something's hard is when someone makes it look easy. That's when you know it's hard. All you young people out there, if something looks easy, that person put in years of work and sacrificed years of fun to make it look that easy. A hundred percent. And also goes into what I was talking about earlier where the Korean pre-production is a lot longer than what the United States allows their films. Production itself is also a lot longer. And part of their workflow, and this is a little inside baseball to anybody who may not be familiar with the Korean filmmaking process, they edit in real time. Kind of like what we do in multi-camera sitcoms where they have the line edit. They actually have real-time editing in Korea, but they also allow themselves to take their time to really get it right. Uh, you know, so you, you, who knows, who knows how many t- takes it took, but the fact is they were willing to take the time to make sure these performances were correct, that the camera moves were correct to use a more broad analogy. Anyone who's ever watched the Jackie Chan movie from when he was in Hong Kong, the reason he likes making his movies over there is because they give him time to do these action sequences. And that's why he didn't like making movies here because they're saying we have to make the day so do what you can yeah they got and- they had like nine days for that stunt in the second one the jackie chan chris chris tucker one when it was like the bamboo scaffolding outside yeah. and he said nine days he said we should have nine weeks yep <laughs> that, was, that was like the famous quote on that yeah some of those tricks you see uh, where Jackie Chan's flipping up a bottle with his feet. I've seen it. I've seen B-roll where he did that 150 times yeah. until he got it right. Until he, and, until he liked it. They had takes yeah. they liked, but he's yeah. such a perfectionist. Um, and, one uh, of the tricks I think they did get, get to have, one of the benefits, and I'm sure they were aware of this, with all that pre-production, is the whole movie almost takes place in the house. Mm-hmm. There's only a scene in a hospital and a scene outside that house, which I'm sure the crew was relieved to get to go outside and work a couple of times. One, yeah. a, a night shot and a day shot, that are two day shots and one night shot. That's it. Everything else, I did a, a small independent film called The House of Yes a long time ago with Mark Waters, who directed Mean Girls and a, and a bunch of other stuff too. Um, and the whole thing, we made the movie for $1.2 million and it was all shot in 
one house. And so it's claustrophobic. The movie makes you feel tight. It's not a, I'll get up and go to the bathroom. Tell me what I missed. You really don't want to miss because you're waiting to be scared. And the only times he takes you outside, it's much different. It's not Baz Luhrmann's scope but he shows you the world and allows you that time to breathe. Oh, and I noticed this in the movie, John, and, and then you, this might, you might want to talk about this more. Takashi Shimizu, the guy who directed The Grudge, and he directed the Japanese version of The Grudge as well called Juon, and wrote and directed both. So this was made in 2000, The Grudge was made in 2004, after... This film came out, the one we're speaking on, The Tale of Two Sisters. There was a shot, and I saw it when it happened, and I jumped out of the couch and like shouted mm-hmm. at you while we were watching this. I said, "That's the Takashi. That's the Takashi shot from the from the hallway." And you said, "No, Takashi got that shot from this <laughs> shot." This, and I was like, "Oh my god!" And it blew my mind because you guys might remember this. If not, it's the most famous shot in the trailer besides the hand in her hair. Um, She's in a long white hallway and the camera is pushing towards my wife. So we should do the grudge one of these days and have Sarah as like the guest. Um, That'd be great. Well, come on, Sarah, the camera put, yeah, girl, what's up, girl. Um, (laughs) The camera pushes forwards towards Sarah. And then as it reaches her, it goes around her. The camera stays on her. And as she looks over her shoulder, the camera goes the other way. And now you can see the entire other side of the hallway and there's nothing on either side and it makes it creepy. He has the same shot, only he uses it outside as like Mm -hmm. this relieving shot. And then it gets tighter as he moves around. And that's when she knows she has to get back to the house because something's up and it creates that tension for her and for us. And I was like, did he take that shot? And you're like, no, man, that shot inspired uh Mm -hmm. takashi and i don't i'm not trying to say takashi stole it i do it's inspiration right like john ford inspires you know sergio leone inspired all these cats inspired quentin tarantino's not a thief he's been inspired by people and he wants to pay tribute to them in his movies and he's done some of his own things that people have now been inspired by and said oh that's the tarantino shot so it's all Mm -hmm. art just inspires art but i remember that moment so well because i thought our guys was better because it's giving you peace at the beginning of the shot and tension at the end. Whereas Takashi's was just tension throughout the shot. Takashi's was uh, Takashi's was a little bit slower. Um, but I, I preferred this one because it made me feel two different ways in like a three second period. It was beautiful. Yeah. And that's the beauty of it. And that's really the recurring theme. And it's a really recurring theme in Kim Ji Yoon's work. We'll watch another one sometime called I Saw the Devil. Oh, which you is, um, mentioned this the night we watched this. Yeah. Yeah. It's a great kind of like really gritty serial killer sort of movie with uh, Lee Byung Hoon. So Lee Byung Hoon is probably, he's like the Brad Pitt of Korea, is what I would kind of Come equate on. him to. He was, yeah. He was like the, he was Storm Shadow in those, you know, I like, I don't like the dump on any movie, but those G.I. Joe movies for my own personal taste, let me make it clear. I was not crazy about him, but Lee Byung Hun played Storm Shadow in those movies. <laughs> Lee Byung Hun is like, I say he's like the Brad Pitt of Korea, just like super leading man look. Very um, leading men in Korea is kind of different because the beauty standards are different. Where Lee Byung Hun's one of those where he matches the beauty standards of Korea, but also has very Western features, the very tight jawline and John, everything. Uh, hold on, yeah. back, elaborate on that for me, the, the different standard of beauty. I know we're not a beauty yeah. podcast, but uh, just explain that to me a little bit more. So in America, we really do emphasize the the kind of the high cheekbone, sort of really sharp jawline, yeah. which, uh, look, I'm a fan of too, but that's not necessarily the unilateral measure of beauty in Korea. In Korea, it's just, it's just different. I, I'm not sure how exactly to put it, but I could show you a side by side and say, oh, this person uh, is good looking here. Like even someone like a Daniel Day Kim, super good looking yeah. leading man, dude. Super handsome. It may surprise people that in Korea, for the most part, people will be like, eh, he's okay. You know, because like he just has these very Western sort of features and that really dominate his face. And uh, they're more about subtlety in Korea. More, they don't like tan faces. Remember, they like very fair skin. That's they like right. More that's right. Out. So that's really just the differences. They would, maybe they wouldn't like me there if I'm, if I'm too tan. 
No, they like Americans, man. Okay, so you're right, good. Cool, you know right, what I mean? Good. Like like me, it could be 50-50. Uh, you just never know. We'll just but, keep um, you indoors for like a month and get your skin super pasty. <laughs> I'll just wear a lot of hats and SPF 1000 for like the rest of my life. And you'll then look like, I'll get there. You look like uh, Sean Patrick Flannery from Powder when I'm done with you. Don't worry. Hey, don't and that that's a solid movie there too. Well, I'm not <laughs> crapping on it. He was just the whitest dude ever in that. Besides, he'd work me, dude. That guy's a black belt in jujitsu. He's no joke. <laughs> He's exactly. legit, dude. I'm telling you, Sean Patrick. Shout out to Sean Patrick Flannery, man. You're the man. All right. So back back to more serious things. Where did these guys? Because you talked about the big three. Where did they get their inspiration? What films have they spoken about? Or can you just tell by watching? that brought this sort of wave, this sort of triumvirate of, of South Korean dudes that kind of changed the way films are made in South Korea. Right. So that's kind of a two part answer. So with someone like a Kim Ji Un, who I talked about at the top of the episode, you talked to this guy, if you read any interview or anything he's talked about, he's the ultimate cinephile and anyone not familiar with the term cinephile, just in simplest terms, someone who's very enthusiastic and knows a lot about film and just really is thirsty for knowledge film about nerds. film history yeah, and film nerds. yeah exactly that's that's the best way to put it so that's really what kim ji Yoon's all about and he really just and that's what i'm i kind of realize about myself as a filmmaker i watch things from here here and here and then i try to juxtapose it all into the uh, into one thing i've made mistakes along the way sure. but you kind of learn about that is, doing your thing yeah and then with someone like a bong joon ho he's very hitchcock and he's very much bringing this sort of realness to his films. If you watch Memories of Murder, which it's not like a, there are scary moments in it. It's more of a crime suspense thriller more mm -hmm. than anything. But we could watch it. And I think it's a fun film to talk about. But you see a lot of Kurosawa's influence on him. Yeah. Especially with his ensemble Which staging. goes back Kurosawa. to John Ford. You know what I mean? Like yeah. all these cats in spot. It's crazy, man. It's like yeah, one exactly. long train. This like locomotive train. And as directors get too old and they can't pull the rest of the load, then they get to go into like the dining car and then the young directors come up and they're the new engine of the train. And it's like Snowpiercer. It just goes around forever and ever and ever. Exactly. Which is a Bung Joon-ho movie. So it's, uh, it's very appropriate. Oh my you, God. Um, it you know, is. Yeah. yeah. Dude, look at that. Look how we just brought it full circle. Just brought on it all back. By right? accident. I almost said on accident. And that's not proper English, John. <laughs> That's all right. I'm dyslexic, so I'm not going to judge on, on any of the grammar. So. Party on. And then with someone like a Pak chan Hook, you see a lot of Tarantino, you know, where and when he, and he just has a unique way of when you watch old boys, this is there are like stop, horror moments that are very scary. Stop selling the people on old boy. <laughs> <laughs> no one's going to like us ever again. Just for the record, John and I. It's not like we loved the content in the movie. We just were like, holy crap, this is a crazy movie. So don't yeah, to edit look all up this still. Out. Go to, go to, no, go to don't, Google don't look up anything. <laughs> Just watch horror movies. Don't worry about old boy. If you see it by accident on TV one day, then go ahead. But you don't yeah. have to seek it out. Do not, in this fair case, enough. in this instance, do not listen to the words of John Lee Brody. Okay, fair enough. Well, we'll leave it at that. But in terms of those, what I consider the my personal big three, and there's certainly many other talented filmmakers out of South Korea. You know, you just, you, when you watch Bong Joon-ho, you see Hitchcock. When you see Pak chan Wook, you see a lot of Tarantino. And when you see um, uh, Kim ji Yoon, you get a little bit of everything. He's like the variety platter that isn't too crowded. Like he finds that proper balance yeah. between all those things, you know. It's wild to me. As the movie continued, I liked the main sister less and the yeah. stepmother more. And every time they get you, they punish you and they let you know you're wrong. And so without spoiling the movie, I want to kind of get to like the end of this and what it makes you want to do. Um, this is a tragedy at its heart. It plays like a Shakespearean tragedy by the end of this, by the end of this film. And I, that doesn't spoil anything. It's just letting you know it's heavy. The whale's very heavy as well. Um, that's, I didn't mean that as a pun, by the way, it's a very heavy movie that affects you deeply. This is the same kind of vibe when you figure, when you figure out what's actually happening in this film. And by the time it's over, and this is the coolest thing about it. It was almost like a video game. You feel like you have to watch it again to see if the director left clues that you missed 
to actually see what was going on in this film. And the son of a bitch did. He just, he does it in such a smooth way. And it's in moments where you won't be looking for them. So when you do watch this, if you want to know where the hidden Mickeys are at Disneyland, it's a lot of moments of peace and happiness that you'll receive these clues and your mind isn't as apt to receive them because you're feeling a little calm and your guard isn't up. Whereas he holds them back in those moments where you're looking to try to figure out what's going on. I think that kind of puts a knot on it without you know, spoiling things. But I will say this, and I'm not trying to bag on the uninvited here. And I love Elizabeth Banks as an actor. I mean, the only time Elizabeth Banks has played things like really big are the 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 orgasm scene in the bathtub with 40-year-old virgin, right? And the Hunger Games. Both times are arguably her two best performances. I mean, it's hard to be big and be believable, right? Jim Carrey knows this to be true by being so unbelievable that he has to be even bigger than big, right? So it 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 gives him a, a wider net to jump into. Elizabeth Banks has to have that an actor's ability to recognize everything that's going on, right? Like you can tell she plays moments smaller if she thinks the soundtrack's going to be big in that moment, right? Like you can see, you can see the, the, the choices that she makes, right? It's like Andy Garcia level good. But when you, and I don't like comparing art, but when you hold these two performances up against each other, you can't fault the actor. You can only fault the script. Because I look at the scenes that, that Jung, Jung Ah was given and they're beautiful. I mean, it's an actor's dream. It's monologue after monologue after monologue. And they're all different. And she's evil. And she's a victim. And she she wants to help. And now she needs help. And she's pissed off. And she's chilling. And she's confused. Like, she gets to do everything in this movie. And Elizabeth Banks, they just left out to dry. It was basically a studio saying, we're trying to make money off Elizabeth Banks. She's the mm-hmm. only name in the film. We're trying to debut these two younger girls. Well, uh, uh, the Kebble girl wasn't new, but the other girl, there, it was she was kind of the lead sister, so to speak. We're trying to get a good rub on her, so Elizabeth Banks will give her the rub, like in wrestling, right? The old wrestler brings the young wrestler in and gives him a good match, but the old wrestler still wins, you know what I mean? But it was a, it was a close match, and everyone respects it. So that's like the philosophy that Hollywood has, right? And I really felt it just destroyed the movie because the glue... For a tale, of, I was going to say the uninvited. For a tale of two sisters, is the stepmother? She drives the whole movie, and they tried to put it on the sisters in the American version, and it just didn't work. And I think the reason why the Grudge made so much friggin' money and kind of brought things back a little bit in horror for about a year and a half after that, where they said, "Okay, we can go." we can go a little smaller with it and try to suspend work on more fear than horror. Right. Um, But I think the reason why the grudge worked and why the uninvited didn't was because they still had the same writer director do both movies. And that's why it remained true because it was from that director's point of view. It just lacked that heart. It lacked those moments to relax it lacked those moments to trick you and it only relied on the on the ghost so to speak and mark and make no mistake the house is haunted there's a spoiler for you the house is haunted Mm -hmm. it's a horror movie it's been spoiled but in this one it was like everything was too big too much and too fast and in a tale of two sisters i'm telling you guys Unless you have to have a car chase in every movie, you will sit the whole time. You will not get up for popcorn. You will hold your pee. You'll reach for your lover, put an arm around him, but not because you're scared, just because it's the most beautiful damn horror movie you've ever seen. (laughs) And then you'll get scared. John, anything else you want to say about A Tale of Two Sisters? 
Absolutely. So I just want to piggyback on two really important things you brought up when they very broadly talking about the ending, because we don't want to spoil it for people who haven't seen it, which I think a lot of people haven't, because even when it got the theatrical release, it was very limited and it's very hard to find on DVD. But this is a big difference also between Korean movies and American movies where American movies were very conditioned to the happily ever after. We got to wrap up everything very very nicely. So we all know this is the end. Where Korea, they're like, they love having vague endings so that we all get to debate what's going on. We even did it uh, after we watched it. You were asking me, you know what I mean? And uh, the thing with Elizabeth Banks, who I also love as an actress, I loved her. I think she had a quick thing in Catch Me If You Can, which is one of my favorite Spielberg movies. And she's really great. It's really quick, but she's really great in it. But that's the other thing where I think we emphasize a lot of subtlety, a lot of internal performances for the most part. At least that's what I've observed. But in Korea, they're not afraid to go big, but they always have it with discipline. It's just like if you're an animator and you can draw anything, that's great. But what's going to make great animation if, is if you discipline yourself to know where do we cut this off and where, where, what's, what's our bookends here. And that's what we really see with Korean movies. And this all goes to preparation, taking time in production and also in post-production, not rushing anything. They do it when it's right. But those are like the two main differences. And also... Also in Asian culture, they believe ghosts are real, where we're conditioned to think there's no, no such thing as ghosts. Scooby-Doo proved that ghosts you know, are not real. <laughs> exactly. Well, Scooby needs to visit Asia, and then he'll know what's they up and maybe do. get a little bit. They went to the Great Wall of China back in like 1983 and saved Asia from, and saved China from the ghosts of the, of the, here's why Scooby-Doo, we're going to end the show. Oh, I'll let you get back to this, but we're addressing no. this right now. Korea, there are no ghosts. Scooby-Doo has given two things to the world. And this is why I always said, people used to give me crap because I had an interview where I said, it's Scooby-Doo is fine American literature. And they were like, what, dude, shut up. Scooby-Doo, let the world know that ghosts aren't real and you can't trust corporates. You can't trust them. Who's the bad guy in the end of every single episode of Scooby-Doo? The corporate scumbag that owns the amusement park and just wants the insurance money, and that's why he made it unsafe, and that's why he's got the ghost, or it's the ghost of the opera house who wants to burn it down and get the fires. You can't trust these sons of bitches, and Scooby-Doo proved it. So you're welcome, Earth. Continue. You know, when you put it that way, <laughs> Scooby-Doo is like the Charlie Chaplin of our era. That's right. Now that I, when you put it that way. If I had one more, it would be the rules of syllogism, and then no one could debate me. But by all means, sir, continue. You were talking about oh, how no, they're comfortable not- with, with abstract endings, with a, with a tragic ending. And this, to me, was very Shakespearean tragedy, but go on. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And and talking about, we emphasize a lot of subtleties. Like, we used to go, you look at old performances, they they used to go really big. And uh, somehow that got all suppressed. And that's still very much believed, not the suppressing part, but they believe that go big with your performances, but do it within reason of the story. But it's motivated in this film. You know what I mean? Like she only goes big when there's moments of tension. So her motive is clear. She's trying to break Mm -hmm. unbearable silence because as Mm -hmm. hard as it is for us to watch, it's harder for the person stuck in the moment because she just wants someone to freaking speak. And so, yeah, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, and, you know, and that's what motivates all her moves. So it feels real. I think America Absolutely. just equates it to either comedy, right? Because of comics like Jim Carrey or, or the many physical comedians that existed before him from Benny Hill to, and everyone in between. Um, and also like, our greats who went big in the nineties post internet and social media were really sort of ridiculed for it. Right. I mean, I've heard so many people do the Al Pacino, the scent of a woman to heat. Oh, things. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and all that. Cause she's got a great butt. I'm not, I didn't say yeah. ASS. Um, I don't know if we curse on this podcast or not. Otherwise it's, she's got a great ass. Yet. Um, and people make fun of that and ridicule it. And it's, it's why it's my philosophy on why kids don't play defense on basketball anymore. Cause they're tired of get, being in, you know, TikTok videos getting dunked on. So they're like, no, <laughs> sir, that's your close up, not a two shot piece. And that's why I, I genuinely think that's why, but I think it's that, okay, if everybody's hating this, then I'm not going to do that. Whereas in Korea, that process, at least right now, or at least then in 03 seemed a, a purer the whole film just 
felt much more honest than the types of of horror we were putting out back then even to to some of the stuff that comes out now you know what i mean it's just everything was rooted in honesty 100 percent. and I'll just piggyback on that as we kind of wrap up i think today's episode and we'll get into our rating in a little bit you know korean films really and this isn't american films used to do this the, in my opinion they don't emphasize this as much at least on the broad scale but American films, by and large, emphasize plot movement. Get to this point by page 15. Get to this beat by page 30. Blah, blah, blah. Where in Korean films, they're more about character development. If it takes you 20 pages to get there, great. If it takes you 30 pages, get there. As long as that's true to the character development. And that's why you fall in love with these characters. You were emotionally invested in two people we don't know. Fictional characters because they're taking the time for us to get to know them and all their quirks. And that's why everything pays off. So... Young filmmakers out there, don't be afraid of the slow burn. Don't be afraid of getting it right. Don't take too long because, you know, you don't want to lose your audience. Do it within reason. But make but them earn it. In my, make them earn yeah. it and then reward them Absolutely. when they do. Absolutely. I think that's the, you know, in this this movie, hopefully uh, there'll be some sort of Blu-ray 4K release, uh, reemergence. Maybe we'll be part of the rest, you know, maybe we'll be responsible for that in some way, shape or form, you know, like we're getting this out there. We get and enough downloads, we'll, uh, I'll pub the heck out of it, man. You know what I mean? Like, and yeah, and that's the other thing. If we get enough downloads, maybe we can do a bonus episode where we really break down with spoilers and just kind of talk through the beats of the movie, which could be cool. But we, again, we got to earn that as well. But if we earn that, then I'm more than happy to do that because um, that's always just fun to do. On the one to five hook scale, John Lee Brody, what is your ranking? Uh, in English, five hooks. And in Korean, dasot hook. So maximum hooks. 100%. It's a masterpiece film and anything less than five would be uncivilized, in my opinion. Oh, Pinhead from Hellraiser would be proud of you. <laughs> That's all he does is fillet people with giant hooks and hang them from a wall with no less than five. This, to me, like I said, the single most beautiful horror film I've ever seen, and it gets four hooks for me. It doesn't get five through no fault of its own. I simply just wished I was Korean at the end of it, and I'm not, so I had to take a star away. But it's a four star for me. It is it is my favorite Korean horror film that I've seen. I haven't seen as many as you, but I've seen a few, and it is absolutely my favorite. Well, John, as always, I love horror movies, and even more so, I love watching horror movies with you. Every once in a while, you guys, we're going to do a B movie, which are usually or a horror film, obviously, but a B horror film. These are usually films with much smaller budgets. So the first one of these films that we watch, and this is truly a work of art, Michael Moriarty, Paul Sorvino, in just a weird cameo, 1985's The Stuff. That's all I'm gonna say. You can look it up if you want and do some research. Now you guys can watch The Stuff for next week. You can pre-hook your rating and then compare your rating to ours. And next week's episode is going to be absolutely horrifically hysterical. Ladies and gentlemen, that was pretty scary.